What's up, time to football faithful. In this episode, we're going to analyze every team and their NFL draft picks from this past week in the 2020 NFL Draft. Welcome in to a new episode of Time to Football. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this wonderful show that we call, you got it, Time to Football. By the way, if you're watching the video version of this podcast on YouTube, I am wearing a hat right now because uh, everything is shut down because of quarantine. All the haircut places are not open, so I wanted to hide my luscious locks. I didn't want to tempt you guys, so shout out to Full Count Baseball on top of that as well. Uh, But we're going to get into our episode for today. It's about the NFL Draft. For the past few weeks, we've been covering the first ever virtual draft, which ended up being a success. Not going to lie. Just my opinion. I loved it. I would rather prefer uh, in person, kids living out their dreams, being on stage, walking the red carpet. I'd prefer that in years to come. I don't think virtual draft every year is, is a good thing, but I loved it. I enjoyed it, and if you tuned into our live reaction show during the first round of the 2020 draft, thank you. We had nothing but positive feedback about that, and we're definitely going to be doing more live streams um, in the next few months during the football season, so uh, you guys loved it. You guys interacted with us during it, and that's what we want. We want this to be uh, not just me talking to you, but a conversation with you guys. So uh, with this being a conversation, let me have a conversation with you and let you know that you don't have to just watch an hour-long video on YouTube if you're watching this video um, on that platform right now. We have this full podcast on iTunes, the audio version of this. So if you pull out your phone, go to the podcast app and search for Time to Football, subscribe to us on there, rate and review, and you can listen to us on the go. But the question is, where are you going to go? You can't go anywhere right now. (laughs) Ha ha! So you're stuck with me. But vice versa, if you're listening to this podcast On iTunes, just know that we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash time to football. Go search for us on there. Subscribe to us. We come out with much more content on our YouTube channel. But today's episode is going to be about the NFL draft, talking about every NFL team and their draft picks. We're going to give my analysis on this. And when I say my analysis, I'm not going to give draft grades. I'm not going to do that. And the reason because like I said, this is going to be a conversation. This is You're involved with this, okay? So I want you to comment below on this video, interact with us, hit us up on social media, Instagram, Twitter, wherever it is, search Time, time to Football, interact with us and let us know who had the best draft from this past week. But I am going to give my opinion on a more positive note, uh, talk about the positives of every NFL team going through the draft picks. And let's start off with the NFC uh, north. So we're going to talk about the NFC first and the AFC. North, south, east, west. North, south, east, west in that order. First team on the list that we want to talk about. The Green Bay Packers. Head scratcher. First round. Training up. Number 26, Jordan Love. Huh? The quarterback from Utah State. Your, your, your team is one game away from the Super Bowl. You're in the NFC Championship. You get blown out, which that's okay. That's okay. Things happen. You need offensive talent, it seems like, especially at the wide receiver position because you've got one of the best quarterbacks, not just in the NFL today, but I believe of all time in Aaron Rodgers. The things that he can do um, are phenomenal. You draft a quarterback when you already have a quarterback. Matt LaFleur the head coach of the Packers, stated that he believes that Aaron Rodgers will be the quarterback for the next few years. Okay? But then why draft Love? Why why draft him if you're not going to play him for the next four to five years? And I think, just my personal opinion, the reason may be with Aaron Rodgers' contract coming coming up in the next year or two, he's going to ask for a lot of money, and I don't think that they're going to resign him just because of his age and just because of the amount of money that he's wanting. And this is the this is the chance, it seemed like, for Matt LaFleur to get the quarterback that he wanted with Jordan Love, pull the trigger on that, and have him uh, sit and, and learn. By the way, we've said this numerous times for the last few weeks, the whole concept of sitting and learning for a quarterback does not make any sense. It's not true. It does not work. 
Leave your comments down below. I'm done talking about it. I don't want to get too much into it. I think they should have drafted a wide receiver. That's just my personal opinion. We had LaVisca Chanel in our mock draft uh, being the wide receiver taken from Green Bay. But then they added some help for Aaron Rodgers with uh, a running back, A.J. Dillon, uh, in the second round. And then a third round, they added a tight end and Josiah DeGuara. So not too bad uh, of a draft, but the first round was when you could really make an impact. And for the time being, an, an immediate impact, probably not so much. But for the long term, we're just going to have to wait and see how Jordan Love does. Moving on to the Chicago Bears. Their first selection was in the second round because of the whole Khalil Mack trade that they made a couple years ago. Second round, 43rd pick, Cole Komet, the tight end from Notre Dame. I like this pick. I really do. I think that Cole Komet obviously was the uh, best tight end talent in that draft class. But on top of that, Chicago has been looking for a tight end uh, for the past few years, it seems like. Trey Burton, that whole experiment ended up being a, a, a bust because he signed a four-year, $32 million contract. Didn't even last uh, two. Well, he lasted two years, didn't go to year three. So uh, he's gone. He's to uh, Indianapolis now. But Cole Komet could be that replacement for him. Uh, they signed Jimmy Graham, which maybe he's past that point, past his prime, but uh, he could still be a factor in helping out uh, Mitch Trubisky or Nick Foles and whoever wins that quarterback job. Then in the second round, you get Jalen Johnson, the defensive back, at uh, pick number 50. So we thought this was a really good pick. I love Jalen Johnson. Uh, in our mock draft, we had Jalen Johnson going in the first round, I believe, uh, to the 49ers at number 31. So Jalen Johnson is a late first-round talent that you got midway through the second round. So this is a, a good pickup to help their secondary for Chicago. The next NFC East team that we want to talk about, the Minnesota Vikings. So the Vikings made a move. I believe that they had the most selections in the draft when it was all said and done, and this was because of the amount of trades uh, that they made. The biggest pick was round one, number 22, uh, Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver, that's 6'1", 208 pounds, pretty fast as it is, and is comparable, I compared him to Stephon Diggs. And so that's why I thought Minnesota was going to make a huge move in trying to trade up uh, for St or for Justin Jefferson, but ended up falling to him at number 22. So that ended up being a good pick, trading him away and getting that 22 pick from Buffalo. Then at 31, they got that pick from San Francisco. They traded up to draft a corner in Jeff Gladney. So two first-round picks for uh, Minnesota. And then on top of that, they they keep on drafting in the second round and the third round. And then Ezra Cleveland, their offensive lineman, who was graded as a first-round talent, who just kept on moving up on draft boards. So Minnesota, for their, their first three picks, ended up doing really well. Next up, the last team in the NFC North is Detroit. Their first overall pick uh, or the first round pick, the third overall pick, a lot of people were talking about trading with the Detroit Lions. They want to trade back and they want to acquire a lot of picks, which, I mean, at the end of the day, they got a decent amount of selections. They decided to stay put at number three and draft the uh, lockdown corner, Jeff Okuda, the cornerback from Ohio State. Makes sense. Can't pass up on him. I like him to help out this Detroit secondary after the loss of Darius Slay. Uh, good replacement, and he's one of those lockdown corners that I feel like he's going to be playing in the league at a at a good, good rate, and is going to be successful in the league for the next ten years. So Kuda, good job by them. And then they get a first round talent running back in the second round with DeAndre Swift from Georgia. DeAndre Swift is going to eat in Detroit. I really love that pick. And not necessarily because I believe that DeAndre Swift, I mean, he could be a three-down back. I think he's talented enough to be. But think of that combo, on Johnson and DeAndre Swift. Now, all of a sudden, things open up for Matthew Stafford in the pass game. So this Lions offense is looking much better. You get your defense, uh, your defensive cornerstone in the first round with Jeff Okuda. And then you get DeAndre Swift to help out that Lions offense. Let's go, Detroit. Good draft. Next up, the NFC South. We're going to talk about the team that everybody seems to hate right now just because of how good they've become uh, over the last month or two, and that is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So the first-round pick, man, they traded up a spot. 
with San Francisco. And they selected Tristan Wirfs, which people thought was the best offensive lineman in that draft. I know that uh, we talked about Andrew Thomas being like a dark horse offensive tackle, which he ended up going first uh, out of that position group. But Tristan Wirfs was being touted. It was between him and Jedrick Wills pretty much as who was the best offensive lineman. And all of a sudden, Tampa Bay ends up with Tristan Wirfs. What a steal for them. So good offensive line help that's going to help out Tom Brady. Um, and then Antoine Winfield Jr., not to be confused with senior that played in the NFL as well, is a defensive back that gets drafted. So they helped out their secondary as well. So they helped out their, their two biggest holes on their team in the first two rounds. So that's huge for Tampa Bay. Because you think about it, their offense, we already know how talented they are. Traded for Rob Gronkowski, which makes them even better. But then on top of that, their biggest holes on offense were the offensive line. They addressed that. Well, then on defense, well, they have a pretty good front seven, one of the best run defenses in the NFL. They need to help in the secondary because their secondary got torched. And then they get Antoine Winfield at number 45. Phenomenal job by Tampa Bay. And then they added a running back on top of that because there's question marks behind Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones. Are they the franchise running backs? Probably not. But is Tom Brady going to operate like he did in New England with a running back by committee approach? It seems like it because they drafted Keyshawn Vaughn at running back. So Vaughn, Jones, Barber, Werfs at offensive line, Winfield at defensive back. Solid draft by Tampa Bay. The New Orleans Saints didn't make a lot of uh, selections in the NFL draft this past week just because they had a lot of their picks taken away from um, from drafting all over the board in the NFL draft. But they had three selections in the first three rounds, which at most most of the time, that's all that matters. Uh, one selection in the first round, that was Cesar Ruiz, the offensive lineman. We saw how emotional he was to get drafted by the New Orleans Saints. And then they had Zach Bond and Adam Trotman um, being selected in the third round. So Zach Bond... We had him being drafted by the Ravens, or I did at least in the uh, in the first round at number twenty eight, and the fact that he fell in draft boards because of the diluted sample controversy, we don't know for sure why that sample was diluted, but he falls in draft boards. The uh, Saints decided to make a move on him. See that that he's still on the board. Hey, Cleveland, let's trade up. Let let us trade up to the number seventy four pick. Let's see if Zach Bond could be our linebacker that we can pair with DeMario Davis, that we can pair with Kiko Alonso. And Zach Bond is going to be a linebacker in New Orleans, and that is a very good pick for the Saints. Moving on to the next NFC South team that we have, the Carolina Panthers. We talked about them uh, earlier when we talked about the Lions. We talked about how they had an all-defensive draft, which was the first time in the modern era, I believe, that a team has selected nothing but defenders in the NFL draft in a single year. So Derek Brown, uh, shout out to him for a guy that's from Linear High School, just right down the road from us. Um, he was selected in the first round, round, round one, pick seven. There was a lot of talk between Derek Brown or Isaiah Simmons, who's the best defensive player in this draft. And it ended up being that the Panthers decided to go with Derek Brown as their defensive tackle. And then in round two, another first round talent seems to fall to them. Round two, pick number 38 overall, Yotur Gross Matos, defensive end, and then Jeremy Chin. A lot of people didn't talk about him, but there were some people out there that said, hey, don't sleep on Jeremy Chin. He's a good safety uh, that could be drafted in the early second round. Uh, he ended up falling to the last pick of the second round with the Panthers trading up with Kansas City to select Jeremy Chin. So their safety, their defensive end spot, and their defensive tackle get the biggest boost from this past NFL draft. And then obviously, you can see on the screen the other defenders that were drafted. A lot of secondary help for them. And then the last team in the NFC South, the Atlanta Falcons. So a lot of controversy surrounds the first pick for the Falcons at number 16. That is A.J. Terrell, the cornerback uh, from Clemson. A lot of people said that, well, Terrell could have been around later in the first round. Why not trade back? Why not hit up the Eagles and say, listen, you have the number 21 spot. We'll trade back to number 21 if you want to jump up to number 16 because we know 
that you need a receiver. We know that Henry Ruggs was just taken, the first receiver off the board. We know that Jerry Judy was just taken, the, the selection prior to this number 16 pick. Listen, CeeDee Lamb is still on the board. If you don't trade up to number 16, the Dallas Cowboys are going to take him. But they decided to stay put instead of trading back and acquiring more picks. But if they feel like that, uh, Terrell is their guy and can compete uh, for a starting cornerback role along with Sheffield and Isaiah Oliver. So we'll have to see. I mean, when you go into practice against uh, one of the best wide receivers in the game today, you know, you're bound to improve. But I like the selection that they made in the second round with Marlon Davison, the defensive end from Auburn. Overall, I love that the Falcons address their needs. Uh, their draft strategy could have been a little bit different, and you could have really taken advantage of getting those extra picks. But at the end of the day, they got their the, the positions that they needed. They addressed uh, their needs. So good job by the Atlanta Falcons overall. Next up, the NFC East, starting off with the Dallas Cowboys. Number 17, CeeDee Lamb falls to the Cowboys. And it's, <laughs> I was on this live stream with, with Michael, uh, if you watched that during the NFL draft. And I was talking to him. I said, listen, man, this was like pick 14, pick 15. CeeDee Lamb or Jerry Judy is going to go to the Broncos. That's what's going to happen because they need a wide receiver with Cortland Sutton. But either one of those two is still going to be on the board. We look at number 17, the Dallas Cowboys. Are they going to draft a wide receiver? They don't need it, but come on. It's Jerry Jones. And I just had this intuition, man, I don't think Jerry Jones is going to pass up on CeeDee Lamb. I just don't see it. And, and they didn't. And part of the reason I felt that way is because I just remember years ago in the 2014 draft when Johnny Manziel was falling in draft boards. People thought he was going to be a top five pick. Ended up being taken 22nd overall by the Cleveland Browns. But then at number 16, I believe it was number 16 when they were picking, Jerry Jones was so close, so close. Had a piece of paper in his hand that said that they were going to take Johnny Manziel just because they don't need him. They have Tony Romo, but just because he's like that offensive player that's just so explosive and just adds that extra dynamic to your offense. And I thought, man, if that's the mindset of Jerry Jones, he wants to select him. And obviously, they chose the right person. They chose Zach Martin, so uh, ended up being a good pick. But let's see if, if CeeDee Lamb can uh, be a good pick of Jerry Jones, and let's see if he does anything for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Is it going to be better than Amari Cooper? I don't know. We're going to have to see, but that is a pretty good duo. Uh, pretty, pretty good trio if you include Michael Gallup in there as well. So that Dallas offense is looking pretty explosive. Then you get Trevon Diggs, defensive back, brother of Stephon Diggs. Moving on to the New York Giants. With their fourth overall pick, they select Justin Herbert. Just kidding. Just making sure you're still paying attention. Andrew Thomas, the big offensive tackle from Georgia. We were sitting there watching the draft, and I was with my co-host, Michael. And he said that Andrew Thomas is the best offensive tackle in this draft. Now, he said that he wouldn't be surprised, after watching film on Andrew Thomas, that he wouldn't be surprised if he goes number four overall, or he's the first offensive tackle taken in this draft. He was right. The New York Giants selected him. The guy's a freaking genius. No one could have expected that. But the Giants select Andrew Thomas to be a blocking left tackle for their investment in Daniel Jones. Not only that, Saquon Barkley, I get that he was injured, but he also had some struggles running behind that offensive line, so this is going to help them out mightily. And then in the second round, you get Xavier McKinney, a defensive back, that people thought that he fell in the draft as well. The New York Giants love the selection with Andrew Thomas and Xavier McKinney especially. The Philadelphia Eagles, the next team that we're going to talk about in the NFC East. The 21st pick was the first pick. We talked about them. We talked about the Atlanta Falcons earlier. A, a, a trade candidate, if they wanted to trade back and get more draft capital. We talked about the Cleveland Browns at number 10. How they were a potential team that the Eagles could jump over the New York Jets the Las Vegas Raiders, the Denver Broncos, these teams that are desperate 
for a wide receiver. Because if you stay at 21, they're just going to get taken and taken and taken. And then, I man, I was watching that draft and I was like, Eagles, where are you? Henry Ruggs is gone. Jerry Judy has gone. CeeDee Lamb is going to be taken away. Trade up with the Atlanta Falcons. But they stayed put. They decided to take Jalen Rager, a wide receiver that had his own pro day, ran an unofficial, unofficial, 4.28 during his pro day. Wide receiver from TCU, they needed speed, and that's exactly what the Eagles got. They had trust that Jalen Rager was going to be still around, but Rager is going to add another dynamic to that Eagles offense that's going to help out Carson Wentz a lot. Someone that may or may not help out Carson Wentz, depending on how you look at it, is Jalen Hurts, who is the second-round selection for the Eagles. Does this make any sense? For the Eagles to take Jalen Hurts, definitely interact with us. We encourage you guys to leave a comment down below. What are your thoughts on Jalen Hurts? Maybe this was just an insurance policy. They know that, hey, for two regular seasons, Carson Wentz, has not finished. You didn't finish a, a playoff game last year, which maybe if you did, maybe you could have beaten the Seattle Seahawks. I don't know. I don't blame those injuries on him. I just think that was tough luck. I don't think he's injury prone. Now, if he had the same injury in his knee, his knee was hurt three times in a row. Yeah, then that's on him because his knee is kind of like a weaker part of his body than he's injury prone. But it, given that it's vertebrae in his back, given that it's a torn MCL and a torn ACL, given that it's a concussion. These are three different things. That's not his fault. It's just luck of the draw. So maybe this is just an insurance policy for Carson Wentz. If he were to ever get hurt, Jalen Hurts could come in and help the Eagles win some games potentially. So then the Redskins, the last team in the NFC East, Chase Young, we predicted that he was going to be taken by the uh, Redskins with the Bengals taking Joe Burrow, obviously. Chase Young, the best player in that draft. How much can he help that Redskins defense is the question. But Chase Young is a good selection, obviously the smartest selection at that point for the Redskins. And then they didn't have a second round pick, but in the third round they chose a wide receiver uh, to pair him up with people like uh, Terry McLaurin, with Steven Sims, these guys that came on the scene last year. Young wide receiver group, young quarterback room. Let's see what's going to happen with the Redskins offense, but good draft by the Redskins as far as their first two selections. Then you've got the Rams moving on to the NFC West. I had a lot of faith in Daryl Henderson and I still do, but I think that Cam Akers, it doesn't hurt to have too many running backs. You know how it is. One, two punch. You don't know if Malcolm Brown is going to be the hot hand. You don't know if it's Henderson. You don't know if it's going to be Akers. And then they, Got that 57th pick from uh, trading with Houston, trading away Brandon Cooks, and they used that to get another wide receiver in Van Jefferson. Which interesting is that J Daniel Jeremiah of NFL Network has said that Van Jefferson's comparison is Cooper Cup. So Cooper Cup and Jefferson, let's see how that pans out for the Rams. The Arizona Cardinals, Isaiah Simmons. It's crazy to think that he fell to number eight. Linebacker, yeah, you could use him, but it wasn't like your biggest need. So, But Isaiah Simmons coming to Arizona is going to help out a lot as Cliff Kingsbury decided to draft him in his uh, massive bachelor pad. So uh, shout out to Cliff Kingsbury and his uh, real estate agents. Uh, then at uh, the third round, number 72 overall, Josh Jones from Houston. I raved about this guy while we were covering the NFL draft. I actually had the Buccaneers selecting Josh Jones uh, in the first round. Um, I had the Buccaneers trading back later in the first round, so that's why it made sense uh, to draft Josh Jones. But for Josh Jones to fall into the third round, whew, that is huge, man. The Cardinals get that offensive line help for Kyler Murray, who seemed to be running for his life, and now maybe he won't. We'll see, but Josh Jones, Isaiah Simmons, two very good selections by the Arizona Cardinals. So moving on to the Seattle Seahawks. So in the first round in the last eight years, the Seahawks have made a move in the first round. Uh, they've traded up, they traded down, they've 
done some sort of move with the first round. They've never stayed with their original pick. But they decided to do that this time with the 27th overall pick and selecting a linebacker in Jordan Brooks. So Jordan Brooks was not on a lot of uh, draft boards in the first round, but the Seahawks are notorious for that, that if they like a guy, they're going to get him. It doesn't matter. Same same thing with the Raiders, which uh, we'll get into when we talk about the AFC West. But if they like a guy, it doesn't matter if they're highly touted by other analysts or anything. They do their own research. They decide for themselves, how is this guy going to fit into my team? And we're going to select him so that nobody else can take him. And they decided to take Jordan Brooks, a linebacker, um, to be the next Seattle Seahawk. And then after that, they just added a lot more depth. They added a guard in the third round. Uh, tight end, Kobe Parkinson, DJ Dallas, the running back, um, and what is an already run-heavy offense. So uh, let's see what the Seattle Seahawks draft picks, what it's going to account to, and if it ends up being a good selection with Jordan Brooks at number 27. Then you've got the San Francisco 49ers. This is interesting. I would say they probably manipulated the board the most out of, uh, and I know I talk about the Minnesota Vikings because they had the most amount of picks, but manipulating as far as trading away their players, trading away uh, their draft picks, they did a good job, I feel like. The 49ers moved back to number 14 and select uh, Javon Kinlaw, defensive tackle from South Carolina. So that ended up being a good pick because in an already stud defense, you got Nick Bosa, you've got Solomon Thomas, which you know, here and there he has flashes. Um, you got rid of DeForest Buckner to the Colts, and that's why you have this number 14 overall pick. But you address that in getting Javon Kinlaw, a younger uh, player who they feel like it could be an impact as well. So in the long run, this might have been a better investment to get the younger player and draft him at number 14. And then we talked about Brandon Ayuk being a wide receiver that the 49ers could potentially take. We mentioned this before in a, in a previous uh, episode, just because of the uh, the talent and the skill set behind Ayuk. He's comparable. I, I compare him to someone like Tavon Austin. I feel like in college, Tavon Austin was a little bit better. Uh, but in Arizona State, I think Ayuk just, he did it all. He can do it all. He can return punts. He can return kicks. He can uh, line up in the, in the backfield. And don't discredit his ability as a wide receiver. He's a good route runner. He's fast, and even for his size, for his height, he's a little bit on the shorter side. He can make some pretty good jump ball catches. You throw a fade to him in the end zone, he's got it. Let's see if that ends up being a good selection uh, for them. And actually, with them getting Ayuk and training away Marquise Goodwin, you have Ayuk, you have Debo Samuel. Those are going to be the two main guys probably, it seems like. Jalen Hurd, don't forget about him. Drafted in the third round last year out of Baylor. You got Trent Taylor, who's coming back from injury. You've got Dante Pettis, who's probably going to be gone more than likely because he's the topic of trade talks. San Francisco 49ers with the players that they got in Trent Williams. They didn't need Matt Breida. They didn't need Marquise Goodwin. Smart draft by the San Francisco 49ers and their general manager. So love it. Love what the 49ers did. So moving on to the AFC, we've got the Baltimore Ravens in the AFC North. It was almost a given at that point that they were going to draft a linebacker with their first round selection. Uh, Patrick Queen, after Kenneth Murray was selected, this this ends up being the smart choice for uh, the Baltimore Ravens to go with linebacker. And then the uh, quote unquote sexy pick for the Baltimore Ravens is the second round pick, number 55, J.K. Dobbins, the running back that they selected. So, hey, I mean, people are saying, why do you need a running back? You've got Mark Ingram. Like, it, it just it doesn't make any sense. you got Gus Edwards. Listen, you can never have too many running backs. The way that the running back position just comes and goes throughout the league, this is just added depth, and this is going to be uh, a good move for the Ravens. And I don't want to say it's just depth because they're going to use uh, Dobbins to his full potential. And I think Ingram, he's not going to be jealous. He's not going to be taken back from this. He's going to be like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. I did the same thing with Alvin Kamara. I shared touches with him, and that ended up being good for me in New Orleans 
Let's do the same thing in Baltimore, where, where a run-heavy team, the 71st pick that they got from the L.A. Chargers, Justin Matabuke, a defensive lineman, and then Devin Duvernay. I don't know if you guys were watching the draft. We were watching day two, and uh, they were showing John Harbaugh's reaction when they selected Devin Duvernay. He was so excited. He, he felt like he just got a steal. He got a diamond in the rough in Devin Duvernay because he's going to fit into that Baltimore Ravens offense so perfectly. So good job by the Ravens and their draft. Next, we've got the Cleveland Browns. So number 10 pick. I actually thought that this was going to be traded to the Philadelphia Eagles for the longest time because the, the Browns talked about trading back and acquiring more picks, but they ended up staying put and going with just sl- seven selections in the uh, NFL draft, and they selected Jedrick Wills, an offensive tackle. It's just interesting to note that a lot of playing time for Wills at Alabama wasn't necessarily at left tackle. It was at right tackle. Maybe he can make the adjustment, or maybe Jack Conklin can move from one position or from one side to the other side. Uh, But either way, I think their thinking was Baker Mayfield was under a lot of pressure last year, and if you get two good bookends and Jack Conklin, which he signed to a five-year contract from Tennessee, and Jedrick Wills, it's going to be a good move for that Cleveland offense. And then at number 44, they draft Grant Delpet, a defensive back from LSU. Uh, who people touted him to be a first-round talent and could have gone in the first round. So you draft another LSU defensive back two years in a row with them drafting Greedy Williams last year. And now this is three straight years that you've drafted a defensive back in the first two rounds, with the first one being Denzel Ward, and then Greedy Williams, and now Grant Delpit. So their secondary is going to be looking decent, we hope, uh, for many years to come. Overall, they have addressed their needs with Jedrick Wills being the main pick that they needed, I think the Browns could have traded back if they really wanted to. Safe choice is to stay put, so I'm not going to be knocking on them for that. Um, So good job by the Cleveland Browns. The Pittsburgh Steelers, they have an act for this. They have an act for drafting wide receivers early on, and they end end up being good. And I feel like I could be wrong about this, but if history teaches us anything, Chase Claypool is going to be a good wide receiver for the Steelers. Maybe he's just good enough to replace Juju if you were to ever get hurt again. Maybe he's just good enough to bounce off of Juju and just be a good number two. Who knows? But the Steelers, like I said, historically, are just good at... Man, they, they know talent when they see it. At wide receiver. And, and Claypool could be another one of those guys. Alex Highsmith, the defensive end that they drafted uh, in the third round. Anthony McFarlane, a running back that they got. Now, I know everybody's saying like, oh, well, you got Benny Snell last year. You got Edmonds. You have Connor. I get that. It's just a reoccurring theme on this podcast. I've been saying it with other teams. You can never have enough running back depth. So let's see how the Pittsburgh draft class is going to pan out. The Cincinnati Bengals with the number one overall pick. This is kind of a given for the past few months. uh, Selecting Joe Burrow at quarterback. They definitely... Took their time doing it. I don't know why. Anyways, regardless of that, Joe Burrow is going to be the next quarterback at the Cincinnati Bengals. And then in the second round, you got him help. T. Higgins, wide receiver. The last time the Bengals got a quarterback and a wide receiver in the first two rounds were in 2011. A.J. Green and Andy Dalton. And that ended up being a good combo right there. So for Burrow and Higgins, this ends up being... um, the, the future for the Bengals. Let's see how they're going to perform. Uh, but both players playing in that national championship, Burrow for LSU, Higgins for Clemson, a good quarterback-wide receiver combo could be the best for years to come. Logan Wilson, a linebacker that they drafted in the third round, and then he got another linebacker in the fourth round, and then some other defensive line uh, and linebacker help. Uh, and then on top of that, offensive line in the sixth round, shout-out to Hakeem Adeniji, of day one sports and entertainment. We had the privilege of um, following Adenogy and his uh, path to the NFL Combine. So if you go back to our YouTube channel and you search uh, Journey to the NFL Combine, you'll find this documentary that we made. And uh, thank you to Derek Gilmore for giving us that that access. And congratulations, Hakeem, for um, getting selected by the Bengals. It's great working with you. You're, you're a good guy. Moving on to the AFC South. 
the Houston Texans. Oh my gosh. Oh man, not a lot of people like Bill O'Brien. I'm I'm starting to learn, and I can see why. I can see why. That's okay. Trading away DeAndre Hopkins, uh, you don't have a first round pick. You know you you gave that up because you acquired Larry Tunsil, Kenny Stills. Cool. That's all good. So you get Brandon Cooks, you get David Johnson. Okay, let's look at the position that you're in now. In in the NFL draft, you have the second round pick, uh, number 40, that you got from Arizona from that DeAndre Hopkins trade. You select Ross Blacklock, which is not a bad selection at all. Not a bad selection. So you help your defensive tackle position, and then you get a linebacker, Jonathan Greenard, uh, in round three. Then you get Charlie Heck, heck of a name. Uh, fourth round, John Reed. They have just they just have a knack for getting corners and or defensive backs with the last name Reed. And then uh, Isaiah Coulter at wide receiver, which he could be the next DeAndre Hopkins. I don't know. But, man, just looking at this draft, I think that I think going into it and coming out of it, I don't think much was going to take away the, the the bitter taste in a lot of Texans fans and a lot of NFL fans as well as like, why would you trade away one of the best wide receivers in the NFL? You know, we don't know what Bill Bryan has planned. Maybe he ends up going 16 and 0 with the offense that he has. I don't know. I, I like Blacklock and I'm not bashing on any of the players, but man, I don't think your team has improved that much as it was when you did have DeAndre Hopkins, uh, which that is the unfortunate truth. Moving on to the Colts. I freaking love Michael Pittman and Jonathan Taylor in the first two rounds. So you gave up your first round pick. And then you select who Frank Reich has said arguably is the best wide receiver in the draft class in Michael Pittman. Those are some bold words, and that's a lot of expectations for Michael Pittman. But he was getting a lot of comparisons uh, as far as his size goes and his playing style to someone like Vincent Jackson, if you remember him, uh, played for the Chargers and the Buccaneers. So Pittman was a guy that they were honed in on for the longest time, and the fact that he was still available, wide receiver from USC, they pulled the trigger on him, and they got him. Not only that, but they traded up. From that number 44 pick, which Cleveland got, to uh, a drafted Grant Delpit with, they traded up with the Browns to number 41. Went up a couple spots because they saw that Jonathan Taylor was still on the board and they drafted a running back from Wisconsin. So this guy had uh, two years with over 2,000 yards rushing, which in college football is ridiculous to do. And then the interesting man, the interesting pick, Jacob Eason at quarterback. Uh, from Washington, formerly at Georgia, at one point, the number one uh, touted high school quarterback in the nation. Good pick. I love it. You got Phillip Rivers, but that's only for a one-year, $25 million contract. After that, you don't know what's going to happen with Rivers. You've got Jacoby Brissett, which a lot of question marks around him. Good player, but is he going to stick around in Indy? So Jacob Eason is the good pick. You've got nothing to lose if he falls that far. Might as well just go ahead and take them. So uh, overall, I'm going to say that this was a very good draft by the Colts. Uh, Chris Ballard and Frank Reich did an excellent job in selecting uh, their players. The Jaguars, another team, at least in the first two rounds, did a phenomenal job in selecting their players. Uh, C.J. Henderson, who moved up in draft boards, I thought he was going to fall to number 16 to the Atlanta Falcons. But he ends up being taken by the Jacksonville Jaguars at number nine overall. They need some defensive back help after trading away Jalen Ramsey for that first round pick, which with that first round pick, they selected Kayla Von Chason, a linebacker who since eighth grade, ninth grade, just pretty young, was already getting division one scholarship offers. So that's crazy to think. Uh, you lose uh, someone like Calais Campbell to the Baltimore Ravens. And Yannick Nagakwe, just the way that he's calling out the president of AEW. Oh my gosh, was that a promo that we saw on Twitter? If so, Tony Khan, sign him right away. He can cut a pretty good uh, promo and get some heat. He's going to make a good heel in AEW. But Caleb Von Chason, a linebacker, is going to be a good replacement. You need some depth at that defense with all those question marks surrounding those players. 
LaVisca Chenault in the second round with a 40, 42nd pick, I thought was pretty good. I had him going to the Green Bay Packers at number 30 uh, if they stayed put and didn't trade up. And then just for fun, let's just mention him. Ben Barch, you heard about him, probably. If you haven't, Google him. Google Ben Barch. Google the uh, shake that he used, that he used to drink. It's ridiculous. It's disgusting. But I love it. I love it. I'm going to have to try it one day. The Tennessee Titans went to the AFC Championship last year, and they made the wild card. They were an underdog, and they kept winning games. But because of that, they had some holes on their team that they needed to fill with them being a wild card team. And the fact that they went to the AFC Championship means you get a later pick. So given that the position that they're in with the number 29 overall pick, they did the best that they could with the pick that they had. Isaiah Wilson, an offensive lineman uh, from Georgia. He was obviously overshadowed by Andrew Thomas, but Wilson is a very good player, and uh, Tennessee needed to address that need after losing Jack Conklin in free agency. Then Christian Fulton, we talked about him, falling in draft boards, almost fell out of the second round, and some, some people touted him to be a first-round pick. So good job by Tennessee on that. And then Darrington Evans, a running back, and with you losing Deion Lewis, a pass-catching running back, Mel Kuyper has stated that Evans is a very good, probably the best uh, pass-catching or pass-blocking running back in this draft, which is right up Tennessee's alley if they want to find a replacement for Deion Lewis. And then they get a defensive tackle in Murchison, Cole McDonald, a quarterback, uh, hopefully to back up Ryan Tannehill, and then Chris Jackson at defensive back. So... I think in the position that they were in, this was a, a good draft by the Tennessee Titans. The NFC East. People were saying that the New York Jets need a wide receiver. Just draft a wide receiver, man. Number 11, you got Jerry Judy, CeeDee Lamb, Henry Ruggs. You can get anyone. Don't do it. Don't fall for it. Because you can draft an offensive lineman, which you desperately need right now, because they're coming off the board pretty quick. And then you can get a receiver Later on, it ended up working out for them. They got Mekhi Becton. This is a deep wide receiver class. You can get a good wide receiver later on, and that's exactly what they did. In drafting Denzel Mims, a wide receiver at number 59, getting that pick from the Seattle Seahawks. This is good for the Jets. This is good for Sam Darnold. This is good for Adam Gase. I want to emphasize the first two picks the most. Mekhi Becton, Denzel Mims. I love that they went O-line and then wide receiver instead of wide receiver and then O-line. I think this was a good draft by the New York Jets as far as the first two picks go. A somewhat, you know what, I was going to say questionable draft. But at this point, with the Patriots and Bill Belichick, I've learned. Just sit back, Hassan. You don't know what you're talking about. Bill Belichick does. Just let him do his thing. Trust him. Which, I mean, he he did, he had a good draft. The Patriots had a good draft. They got safety. They got two linebackers. They needed tight ends. Uh, they needed to uh, replace Stephen Kostowski as well, so they got a kicker. But no quarterback. And I think going into it, that was the, the number one thing. We were like, man, Jordan Love makes so much sense for the Patriots. Jalen Hurts. Makes a lot of sense for the Patriots. Jake Fromm, I was sitting there watching the draft, and every time I saw the Patriots on the clock, I was like, dude, let this be Jake Fromm. That would be amazing if it was. Once free agency passes and once the draft uh, passes, you're almost more than likely set on your roster going into preseason. That's just how it is. That's just the nature of the NFL. So they're more than likely... Not going to add another quarterback. They signed a couple of guys uh, that were undrafted. But we'll see how, how that pans out. But I think the biggest question mark for the Patriots was why not draft the quarterback? I trust Bill Belichick enough, and I've watched a lot of Bill Belichick in my life to know not to question the guy. So, Bill, this could be the greatest draft class in NFL history. And if it is, I wouldn't put it past you. Moving on to another AFC East team, 
the Miami Dolphins selecting Tua Tagovailoa with the fifth overall pick. Didn't need to trade up with the Detroit Lions to select uh, him at all. I love what the Dolphins are doing with their team, and I think that this was one of the better. I talked about the Colts having one of the better draft classes, but I think that the Dolphins, with what they've gone through, they still won five games. Brian Flores got this team together. This this team played for this coach. We thought that they were going to go own 16. But the fact that they were 5-11 and 11 and then you can draft your franchise quarterback, not only that, but you put help around him. Austin Jackson at tackle with that pick that they traded away, Minka Fitzpatrick, which I'm not going to lie. I think they should have kept Minka Fitzpatrick, but uh, you get that tackle help for Tua Tugavailoa. And then a 30th drafting a defensive back, which you've already added uh, Byron Jones. Pairing with Xavier Howard, this is going to be a good secondary. They want to compete uh, in that AFC East. I think the Dolphins did a, a phenomenal job in, uh, in drafting this year. Him, or Brian Flores and Chris Greer uh, did a very good job. So watch out for the Dolphins. They could be a surprise team. The Bills. Uh, an AFC East team that did not have the first-round pick after acquiring Stephon Diggs from the Minnesota Vikings. They draft A.J. Epinesa, who fell uh, all the way to the second round, and it might be because of his uh, uh, lack of speed, per se, that uh, kind of hurt, hurt his uh, his draft stock. But Epinesa falls, and then Zach Moss gets drafted uh, at running back. I saw someone say that... Uh, Man, that's uh, disrespectful to Devin Singletary. Why are you going to draft Zach Moss? Man, you, you put them in two together, and it's a tandem. And uh, Devin Singletary, I love him, and I do think he's capable of getting 20 carries a game. I I, I think he, the, the way he operates and the, the way he can uh, get the most or you can get the most out of him is if you split time with someone else. Not saying that he's going to be 50-50. Maybe he's going to be 70-30. Uh, but Zach Moss could be that guy that comes in and gets that 30% of share from Devon Singletary. Draft a wide receiver in the fourth round, Gabriel Davis, and then Jake Fromm. No, no need. They didn't need him. But he was drafted 167. And to think that at 159, the Patriots could have gotten Jake Fromm just eight picks earlier than the Bills. Decided to pass on him to get Stephen Kostowski's replacement. He's just intelligent. And if he falls that far into the fifth round, Sean McDermott, you, you've got no choice. You, you've you got to take him because you don't know what he's capable of. You don't know what you're going to do with him. Maybe he comes in if Josh Allen were to get hurt, and he does a very good job. Not saying that he's going to take Josh Allen's job, but he's he's going to be a good uh, number two guy for the Bills. So um, I like that they, they just pulled the trigger on him. We don't need him, but let's just get him. Let's see what happens. So I love that pick the most for the Buffalo Bills. I think that the Denver Broncos offense is looking a lot like, dare I say, an NFC South offense. Jerry Judy, wide receiver, you drafted 15 overall. KJ Hamler, 46 overall. Look a little bit later. You drafted tight end in the fourth round. Pair him up with Noah Fant. You've got Cortland Sutton already. You've got Melvin Gordon that you signed a free agency. You've got Philip Lindsay. I mean, this this offense, they're just building around Drew Locke. This offense is looking sexy. So I love what the Denver Broncos did with the offense, but build around Drew Locke. That's what you need to do, and I love it. Next AFC West team. The LA Chargers drafted Justin Herbert at quarterback to be their next guy behind Phillip Rivers. I think overall this was their guy this whole time. I think that if they really wanted to attack a Viloa, they are going to trade up to that number three spot, but they did it. I think that Herbert was the guy that they were honed in on and they felt like he could be the franchise quarterback for the future. So um, Herbert is going to be uh, backing up Tyrod Taylor, maybe starting over him. We're just going to have to see what the Chargers decide to do, but I like that pick a lot. And then they trade back up into the first round to select Kenneth Murray at linebacker to that number 23 spot from the New England Patriots, who I thought was the best linebacker in that draft class. So good job, uh, by the Chargers to draft Kenneth Murray. Uh, then Josh Kelly at running back. Then I have a, uh, a pick, a selection, uh, because they traded up uh, to that number 23 spot. Then I have a selection for the next two, two rounds. So in the fourth round, they select Josh Kelly and pair him up with Austin Eckler. Melvin Gordon is gone. 
So this might be a good one-two punch for the Chargers on top of that. It'd be interesting to see if they're going to start Justin Herbert right out the gate or if Tyrod Taylor is going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, definitely let us know your thoughts. What do you believe? Do you think that Herbert's going to start or do you think that Taylor is going to start uh, in week one? Let us know in the comments down below. The Las Vegas Raiders, a franchise that we talked about earlier that doesn't care what other draft analysts have on their draft boards. They really don't. If they love a guy, they're going to draft him with their first-round pick. That was evident last year when they drafted Cleveland Farrell, number four overall, over someone like Josh Allen, who went to the Jaguars. Now, uh, it's proven right now that Josh Allen ended up being the better option, but uh, who knows? Maybe Farrell's going to pick it up in a sophomore campaign. And that was evident in this year's draft class when, at number 19, they drafted Damon Arnett, a cornerback, which a lot of people were saying, who's Arnett? Who is this guy? But that's exactly how Mike Mayock operates. If he loves a guy, he's going to draft him. And, you know, let's see if it pans out for the Raiders. At number 12 overall, uh, a selection before that with their pick, they had Henry Ruggs as their uh, first selection by the Las Vegas Raiders in history. So a pick that Al Davis would have loved because of the speed that Henry Ruggs possesses. I love the pick. It makes the offense just much more dynamic. I don't like the inconsistency, though, uh, especially in fantasy football. That's my biggest gripe in fantasy football is I hate inconsistency. If, if I need to guess whether a player is going to have two catches for 24 yards one week or eight catches for 113 yards and three touchdowns, and it's just back and forth with that, I'm not going to even bother with it. Like, you can have them. I, I'm, I'm cool with that. But um, it might bring some inconsistencies with that in the uh, Oakland Raiders offense, but when you need them, like, it, it, it could pan out. So with Tyrell Williams being there as well, we believe that Tyrell Williams, I don't think he's a, I think he's better than a number two receiver, but he's not quite a number one receiver. He's like a good one and a half. So with Henry Ruggs there, maybe that's going to make both of them, um, they're going to bounce off of each other and both of them are going to excel, but we'll have to see. But I love that dynamic that it brings to that Raiders offense and the possibilities that they can do. And the last team, we're going to wrap it up with the best team in the NFL uh, from last season, the Washington Redskins. Just kidding. Just making sure you're still paying attention. The Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs had an interesting draft. And a good draft, I would say. Drafting Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, the first running back taken off the board. They need help with Damian Williams because I don't want to discredit Williams. He, I believe he should have been Super Bowl MVP. But I think he's best when you have a good talent with them, when you split time, um, not so much as a three-down back. And so I was, saying, I was thinking to myself, okay, maybe like Jonathan Taylor, maybe DeAndre Swift. Like these guys, they could be three-down backs themselves, and maybe they could take Damian Williams' job. But if you want to split time with Damian Williams, these are good players that you could take. And we were talking about it, and we thought, well, maybe Jonathan Taylor is more suited for uh, an offense like the – Baltimore Ravens, like just a ground pound uh, kind of deal. Um, and DeAndre Swift, we thought maybe the Dolphins were just going to take him in the first round. So at that point, yeah, maybe Clyde Edwards Hilaire is the best option at that point. But DeAndre Swift was still on the board, decided to pass up on him and take Edwards Hilaire. They're pretty high on him. So uh, I think this is going to be good to, to split time uh, with Damian Williams. Uh, they got Willie Gay Jr., a linebacker. And then they added a tackle, a safety, a defensive lineman, and then a cornerback as well. So the biggest pick for them, obviously, was that Clyde Edwards-Hilaire pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. Wow, that was a lot of information, a lot of thoughts, a lot of opinions, and a lot of analysis on these NFL teams and the NFL draft. But that kind of concludes our um, NFL draft coverage overall. But uh, stay tuned. We've got much more content uh, throughout the offseason coming for you guys. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button, like this video, and definitely leave a comment down below um, on your thoughts on these uh, draft classes. Who do you think had the best NFL draft? Um, like I said, I don't grade them. That's for you guys to decide. So you guys definitely uh, leave your comments down below and interact with us. And if you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, be sure to uh, hit us up on YouTube. Subscribe to us on there. 
uh, youtube.com slash time to football and definitely interact with us as well on social media on instagram and twitter the username for both is at time to football Whew. with all that said thank you guys so much for listening to this on itunes and watching this video and i'll catch you guys later